Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard. Today I turn the camera over to you, the Hollywood Graveyard community, as we travel the world to visit famous and historical graves in your neck of the woods. In this tour we continue through America's heartland, the Midwest, to find legends like Abraham Lincoln, Prince, Will Rogers, Elaine Stritch, and many more. My friends, the time is yours. Part 13 of our viewers special, also known as part 7 of round 2 of our viewers special. Also known as part 2 of our coverage of the Midwest in part 7 of round 2 of our viewers special. Whew, that's some inception level grave hunting right there. If you can't wrap your head around it, let's just say that today we're exploring Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. Now then, let's do what this bench says. We begin our tour today in Illinois. This is Memorial Park Cemetery in Skokie. In the 70s, TV's favorite blended family ruled the airwaves, and here lies its patriarch, Robert Reed. Between 1969 and 1974, Reed played Mike Brady on The Brady Bunch. It's the story of a man named Brady, the Brady Bunch, the Brady Bunch. Reed is also remembered for playing Kenneth Preston on the legal drama The Defenders in the 1960s. He can also be seen in the miniseries Roots. Robert Reed fought both cancer and HIV, passing away at just 59. Also here we find legendary actress and singer Elaine Stritch. She is considered one of Broadway's greatest performers, known for Tony-nominated roles in plays like Bus Stop and musicals like Company. Her one-woman play, Elaine Stritch at Liberty, won the Tony Award in 2002. Elaine would then move into television, winning Emmys for shows like Law & Order, and for playing Colleen Donaghy on 30 Rock. Elaine Stritch died in her sleep at age 89. Elaine rests here with her husband, John Bay, who was something of an actor himself, seen in various film and TV roles in the 60s and 70s, including Doctor Who. He was just 53 when he died from brain cancer. This is the grave of actress Karen Cookie Cupsonet. She had recurring roles on shows in the 60s like Hawaiian Eye and The Gertrude Berg Show, and can be seen in films like The Little Shop of Horrors, but it was her death that would make the biggest headlines. Just days after the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963, Karen was murdered in her West Hollywood home at the age of 22. Occurring so close to Kennedy's assassination and her father's prominent place as a Chicago newspaper columnist, led Karen's name to be among many wrapped in various conspiracy theories surrounding it. This included the debunked claim that she was murdered by the Mafia to silence her for having known in advance that Kennedy would be killed and who was responsible. Karen's murder remains unsolved to this day. Our next cemetery is Cedar Park Cemetery in Calumet Park. Here lies Nelson Ellis. As an actor, he garnered critical acclaim for his role as Lafayette Reynolds in the HBO series True Blood. On film, he played Eddie in Secretariat and Martin Luther King Jr. in The Butler. Ellis battled drug and alcohol abuse and was attempting to get clean, but in the process was hospitalized with serious complications of alcohol withdrawal syndrome, which led to heart failure at just 39. Our next stop is one for you fans of gangster lore. This is Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside and the grave of Scarface himself, Al Capone. He reigned for seven years as boss of the Chicago outfit during the Prohibition era, becoming the nation's best known bootlegger. He became something of a national celebrity saying he was simply a businessman giving people what they want. But his means grew increasingly violent, culminating in the St. Valentine's Day massacre of rival gang members. He had politicians and law enforcement in his pocket, until Elliot Ness led a group of untouchables to get Capone off the streets. He was eventually imprisoned, not for murder or bootlegging, but for tax evasion. While in prison his health began to fail from syphilis. He was released after eight years and died in 1947 at age 48. As one of America's most notorious gangsters, Capone has served as a model for gangsters and crime bosses in countless media productions. Speaking of gangster roles, also here at Mount Carmel we find actor Dennis Farina, a familiar face to film and television audiences beginning in the 80s. He played mobsters in films like Get Shorty and Midnight Run. 
Farina would also play police officers, like in the film Manhunter and on Law & Order. He was abundantly qualified for such roles as he worked 18 years for the Chicago Police Department before breaking into acting. Farina died from a pulmonary embolism at age 69. One of the most iconic voices in sports broadcasting rests here at All Saints Catholic Cemetery in Des Plaines. Here lies Harry Carey. As a sportscaster, he covered five Major League Baseball teams between 1945 and 1997. The St. Louis Cardinals, the St. Louis Browns, the Oakland Athletics, the Chicago White Sox, and of course, the Chicago Cubs. He would broadcast more than 8,000 games in his career, embodying the fun and energy of the ballpark. The inscription, holy cow, here on the tombstone was his signature expression. Holy cow! Harry Carey passed away at age 83 from complications of a heart attack and brain damage. Over his career, he was inducted into multiple halls of fame, including the American Sportsman Hall of Fame. He was also famously caricatured by Will Ferrell on SNL. Next up here at All Saints, we find James Woolley. He was a musician who played keyboards and synthesizers for Nine Inch Nails in the 90s. Jim would win a Grammy for his work with Nine Inch Nails for Happiness in Slavery. Tragically, Jim died from injuries sustained in a fall from a ladder while retrieving equipment in his studio. He was 49. This mausoleum houses Robert Ringling. He was an opera singer, known particularly for his work in the operas of Wagner. In 1934, he quit his successful opera career to help run the family business. Given his name, I'll bet you can guess what that was. You got it. He helped run the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus as chairman of the board. Robert died from a stroke at just 52. We find ourselves now at Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside. Here is the crypt of Mark Venturini. As an actor, he's remembered for his roles in 80s horror films, like Victor in Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, and a suicide in The Return of the Living Dead. He also made guest appearances on TV shows like Murder, She Wrote. But Mark's career was cut tragically short by leukemia at just 35. If you play the drums, then you know our next star, resting here at Holy Cross in Calumet City, Gene Krupa. He was a band leader, composer, drummer, and consummate showman. He's the man who helped elevate the drums from a mere rhythmic accompaniment to a bona fide solo instrument. His innovation of the drum solo can be heard in timeless tracks like Sing Sing Sing. Gene played with legends like Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey and is considered by many as the founding father of the modern drum set. Gene Krupa died from heart failure at age 64. A film would be made about his life, The Gene Krupa Story, starring Sal Mineo as Gene. We're now at Evergreen Memorial Cemetery in Bloomington. Here we find the unique grave of a folk figure connected to the wonderful land of Oz, Dorothy Gage. Little Dorothy was born to Sophie and Thomas Gage in 1898. Five months later, the family was devastated by her death. Dorothy's uncle was L. Frank Baum, author of The Wizard of Oz. To give small comfort to the family for the loss of Dorothy, he named the main character of his book after her. In 2017, it was determined that this tree had to come down. An artist named Bill Baker was tasked with carving Dorothy, Toto, and the Yellow Brick Road into the stump of the tree as a tribute to little Dorothy, whose final resting place is nearby. This new stone for Dorothy's grave was made and donated by Mickey Carroll, who played one of the munchkins in the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz. Another legend immortalized in carved wood here at Evergreen is Charles Radborn, nicknamed Old Hoss. He was a pitcher who played 11 years in the National League and Players League, during which time he would win an impressive 310 games. In 1939, Old Haas was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was just 42 when he died. This is Heron Cemetery. Here we find a monument to a dark era in American labor disputes, the Heron Massacre. In June 1922, the United Mine Workers of America were on strike. 
But at a mine here in Heron, the owner, seeking revenue, brought in non-union workers and strike breakers to produce coal. Tensions escalated between strikers and strike breakers, and gunfire was exchanged, killing two and mortally wounding a third. The next day, an angry mob of union miners descended on the mine to exact revenge. The strike breakers in the mine agreed to stop work in exchange for safe passage. The fifty or so workers were marched with their hands up toward town, but upon reaching a barbed wire fence were told by the mob to run for their lives before opening fire on them. Several strike breakers who survived the firing squad were captured and were ordered to crawl here to Heron Cemetery, where they were tortured and killed. In all, some 23 people died in the dispute, 17 of which are buried here at Heron Cemetery in unmarked graves. To add to the tragedy, sympathetic local juries refused to convict anyone for the killings. We're in Shiloh now, and Shiloh Valley Cemetery. Making our way into the grounds, we find the grave of Mary Wicks. As an actress, she was known for playing prim and proper ladies, nurses, and quite often being typecast as a nun, like in Sister Act and The Trouble with Angels. On TV, she was the first actress to portray Mary Poppins on screen, and had regular roles in shows like Dennis the Menace and Father Dowling Mysteries. And in the world of Disney, Mary was the model for Cruella de Vil, and was the voice of Laverne in Hunchback of Notre Dame. She died after complications from surgery at age 85. Next up is Oakland Cemetery in Woodstock. Here in the shadow of a tree we find a famous figure in Hollywood crime, Johnny Stampinato. He served as a Marine during World War II, after which he made his way to Los Angeles where he would soon become the bodyguard of mobster Mickey Cohen. By 1957 Johnny was in a relationship with actress Lana Turner. Their relationship was stormy, sometimes violent. On April 4, 1958, Stampinato was fatally stabbed by Lana's 14-year-old daughter, Cheryl. She claimed self-defense, that Stampinato had been violently attacking her mother. A coroner's inquest later determined that it was justifiable homicide. Johnny Stampinato was 32. From Oakland to Oakwood. In this cemetery, we find a name synonymous with your neighborhood drugstore, Walgreens. Charles Walgreen. In 1901, Charles Walgreen started a drugstore in the south side of Chicago. By 1916, he owned nine drugstores, which he incorporated as Walgreen Co., which began also selling low-priced lunches and ice cream. Walgreens is now the second largest pharmacy store chain in the U.S. To all you Eagle Scouts out there, did you get your Grave Hunting Merit Badge? What's that? There is no Grave Hunting Merit Badge? Well, there should be. This is William Boyce, the founder of the Boy Scouts of America. He began his career as a newspaper and magazine man, but also loved to travel and the outdoors. While on a trip to England, he was introduced to the scouting movement. Upon his return to the U.S., he formed the Boy Scouts of America in 1910. The BSA is today one of the largest youth organizations in the nation. Boyce died from pneumonia at age 70. Our next Illinois stop is Woodland Cemetery in Quincy. Here lies Roy Brocksmith. The beloved character actor was never a leading man, but he made his indelible mark on many productions we love. These include Total Recall, Arachnophobia, and Cole the Conqueror. And on TV he made guest appearances on shows like Tales from the Crypt, and had a principal role on Picket Fences. Roy died from complications of diabetes at age 56. His grave features a quote from Jack London. This is Springdale Cemetery in Peoria. Here lies Frank Weed. He was a U.S. Navy aviator turned screenwriter. As an authority on early aviation, he took his knowledge to Hollywood to write movies, including 1938's Test Pilot, which earned him an Oscar nomination. He received a second nomination for The Citadel. Frank even had a movie made about him, John Wayne portraying him in the film The Wings of Eagles. He died from complications from surgery at age 52. 
No exploration of famous graves in Illinois would be complete without a visit to Springfield and one of the most famous and visited grave sites in America, that of Abraham Lincoln. The tomb of Abraham Lincoln is located at Oak Ridge Cemetery here in Springfield. He was the 16th President of the United States, and one of the most consequential as he helped lead the nation through the Civil War, preserving the Union and abolishing slavery. The self-educated lawyer from Kentucky was elected president in 1860. Pro-slavery southern states saw his presidency as a threat to slavery and began to secede from the nation, beginning with South Carolina. The Civil War broke out shortly thereafter, and Lincoln fought to suppress the rebellion and restore the Union. It seemed a near impossible task to bring together parties that seemed to be at such odds, something perhaps we can relate to today. His Gettysburg Address aimed to do just that, describing our nation as one conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Lincoln succeeded in preserving our Union when the Civil War ended, when General Lee surrendered to General Grant in 1865. On January 1, 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. Lincoln was re-elected president in 1864 and worked to heal a war-torn nation through reconciliation. But just days after the Civil War's end, Lincoln was watching the play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington. There he was shot in the head by a well-known stage actor named John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln was attended to by physicians but succumbed to his injuries the next morning. On April 15, 1865, he was 56. The entire nation went into mourning, and Lincoln's body traveled the nation for three weeks on the Lincoln funeral train, mourners lining the tracks to sing hymns and pay their respects. Lincoln was the first major public figure to be embalmed, allowing for this extended viewing period. Lincoln's body was temporarily entombed in various nearby locations while this monument was being built, finally being permanently laid to rest here in 1901. Here too are his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and several of his children. As we say goodbye to Mr. Lincoln and the state of Illinois, be sure to rub Honest Abe's nose for good luck. Before moving on to our next state, let's hop back over the border to Wisconsin real quick to visit a site we missed in our coverage of Wisconsin in our previous video. This is Oak Hill Cemetery in Lake Geneva and the grave of Gary Gygax. He was a writer and game designer best known for co-creating the pioneering role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons, first published in 1974. The popularity of the game would lead to an animated series in 1983, which he co-produced. To this day, Dungeons & Dragons remains the market leader in role-playing games and is frequently referenced in other media, like Stranger Things. Gary died from an aortic aneurysm at the age of 69. The dice here on his grave are those used in Dungeons and Dragons. Our journey takes us now to Minnesota. We'll spend much of our time here in the Twin Cities area. One of the more notable cemeteries here is Lakewood in Minneapolis. Let's head first into the mausoleum. Here we find the crypt of the legendary Tiny Tim. The comedic musician was well known to television audiences in the 60s and 70s for his long hair, ukulele playing, and singing in a high falsetto voice with dizzying vibrato. This inimitable sound is perhaps best showcased in his signature song, a cover of Tiptoe Through the Tulips. <laughs> Tim was a frequent feature on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In and The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he loved performing for live audiences as well. In November 1996, he was playing a gala benefit here in Minneapolis. While performing Tiptoe Through the Tulips, he suffered a heart attack on stage. He tried to make his way back to his table but collapsed and never regained consciousness. He died at age 64. At his funeral, a ukulele was placed in his coffin. Let's head back out to the grounds, where we run into a species of Hollywood graveyard animals that we've not yet encountered, wild turkeys. Nearby is the grave of actress Alice Frost. She was an inaugural member of Orson Welles' Mercury Theatre, 
and would become one of the big stars of radio dramas, most notably in the series Mr. and Mrs. North. Alice became known as the Girl of a Hundred Voices. She would then become a regular player in early television in shows like Mama, The Twilight Zone, General Electric Theater, Bonanza, and more. Alice lived to be 92. Over now to the garden wall section is the crypt of Cliff Simak. He was a science fiction writer known for his work during the golden age of sci-fi. He began publishing stories for pulp publications in the 30s. He wrote hundreds of short stories and more than 30 novels, one of which, Waystation, winning the 1964 Hugo Award. He would win numerous other accolades for his writing, and in 1987 became one of three inaugural winners of the Bram Stoker Lifetime Achievement Award. Simak lived to be 83. On to section three, and the grave of an artist named Les Cuba. He was one of the world's foremost wildlife painters, his work appearing on magazine covers, conservation stamps, and more. Other of his notable works include a redesign of the Coca-Cola logo, a statue of Chief Little Crow, and designing the old Dutch windmill logo. Les lived to be 81. Next up here at Lakewood is author and playwright Thomas Hagen. His best known work is his 1946 novel Mr. Roberts, based on his experiences in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Mr. Roberts would be made into a Tony Award winning play, as well as a film starring Henry Fonda. Tragically, Hagen drowned in his bathtub after an overdose of sleeping pills. He was just 29. How about a quick snack to fuel our graving strolls today? Maybe a croissant or a cookie courtesy of the Pillsbury family. Charles A. Pillsbury was the co-founder and namesake of the C. A. Pillsbury Company, founded in 1869. It would grow to become one of the world's largest producers of grain and other foodstuffs. Charles co-founded the company with his uncle, John Pillsbury, who also served as Minnesota's eighth governor. If the Pillsbury Doughboy didn't satiate your hunger, maybe the Mars family can help fill the void. Franklin Mars founded the Mars Candy Factory in 1911, later Mars Inc. They focused on the manufacture and sale of candy, notably chocolate candy bars. In 1924, they introduced a product conceived by Frank's son, Forrest Mars, inspired by the milkshakes so popular in that era, the Milky Way candy bar. It would become a best-selling treat worldwide. Mars would later go on to develop other favorites that ended up in your trick-or-treat sack, like Snickers and M&M's, which stands for Mars and Murray, Bruce Murray being the guy who helped develop the candy coating that ensured they melted in your mouth, not in your hand. To date, Mars is the largest candy company in the world. With our bellies filled with sweets, let's move back into the entertainment world, visiting Carl Mueller. He was a musician, the bass player and founding member of the Minneapolis rock band Soul Asylum. They formed in the 80s and had a Grammy winning hit in the 1993 song Runaway Train. Runaway train. A longtime smoker, Carl was diagnosed with cancer in 2004, passing away a year later at just 41. Our next Minnesota stop is Roselawn Cemetery. Here we explore Minnesota's hockey legacy at the grave of Herb Brooks. He was a hockey player and coach whose greatest legacy came in the form of what would be known as the Miracle on Ice. In 1980 he was head coach of the U.S. Olympic hockey team. The U.S. was up against the heavily favored gold medal defending Soviet Union team. The underdog Americans pulled out a miraculous 4-3 victory. This victory led them to a gold two days later against Finland. The victory became one of the most iconic moments in U.S. sports, and of course, inspired a movie. Brooks died in a car accident shortly after turning 66. He was posthumously inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Also here at Rose Lawn we find Mitch Hedberg. He was a popular stand-up comedian known for deadpan delivery and short, sometimes one-line jokes. He would also make several appearances on screen in shows like That 70s Show and movies like Almost Famous. 
On March 30th, 2005, Mitch was found dead in his New Jersey hotel room from an accidental drug overdose. He was 37. His death was announced April 1st, leading some to initially believe it was an April Fool's joke. Tragically, it was not. This is Gethsemane Cemetery. Let's head into the chapel mausoleum. High on the wall is the crypt of Mr. Perfect, Curtis Hennig. He was a professional wrestler, wrestling for the AWA in the 80s. In 1987, he won the AWA World Heavyweight Championship. He would then move to the WWF. He came to be regarded as one of the best competitors pro wrestling ever produced. In 2003, Hennig died from a cocaine overdose in his Florida hotel room. He was 44. Mr. Perfect was posthumously inducted into the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. Fort Snelling is a national cemetery here in Minnesota, where heroes rest. Among them, a hero named Thomas Burnett. Tom was aboard Flight 93 on the morning of September 11, 2001, when it was hijacked by terrorists. He called his wife and she told him of the attacks on the World Trade Center. He and the other passengers realized it was a suicide mission and the terrorists intended to crash their plane into a high-profile target as well, likely the White House or Capitol building. Tom and several other passengers knew they couldn't just sit quietly and formulated a plan to take back the plane. He ended his call with his wife telling her, don't worry, we're going to do something. And they did heroically storming the cockpit, preventing the plane from reaching its target, but in doing so lost their lives when the hijackers crashed the plane into a Pennsylvania field. Tom was 38. His and the others' courageous actions will be remembered forever. Earlier we visited the creator of Dungeons & Dragons. Here is one of its artists, David Sutherland. David was one of the original illustrators for Dungeons & Dragons. His notable work includes the cover of the original Dungeons Master's Guide, as well as drawing the popular isometric maps, like that of Castle Ravenloft. But now it's time for David to map heaven. He died from liver failure at age 56. This is the Minneapolis Jewish Cemetery. Here we find Dear Abby herself, Pauline Phillips. She was an advice columnist who began the well-known newspaper column Dear Abby in 1956. It became the most widely syndicated newspaper column in the world, with over a hundred million readers. It was well known for sound, compassionate advice delivered with the straightforwardness and sometimes comedic style of a good friend. Pauline wrote the column alone until 1987 when her daughter joined her. After an Alzheimer's diagnosis in the early 2000s, her daughter took over the role as Dear Abby entirely. Pauline lived to be 94. Adath Yashuran Cemetery is in Edina. Here we find a composer named B.B. Barron. She was a pioneer of electronic music, building and designing instruments with her husband, Louis, to manipulate electronically generated sound waves and record them to tape among the first to do so. Their innovative sound and techniques caught the ears of producers of the landmark 1956 film Forbidden Planet. They were hired to compose the score for the film, which was the first entirely electronic film score. Eerie and sinister, it was unlike anything audiences had ever heard before. It was so unusual, the musicians' union wouldn't even allow it to be called music, but rather electric tonalities. It's now what we think of as the sound of sci-fi. Bibi lived to be 82. We're now at St. John the Baptist Parish Cemetery. This is where 60s teen idol Bobby V is laid to rest. He was a popular singer who had some 38 Hot 100 hits, six of which were gold singles, like Take Good Care of My Baby. Take good care of my baby. V would often appear as himself in film and television, like 1962's Play It Cool. V was diagnosed with Alzheimer's later in life, passing away at age 73. Rolling right along, we reach Greenwood Cemetery. In these grounds rests author Sinclair Lewis. 
as his stone indicates he was the author of Main Street. The satirical novel was written in 1920 and became immensely popular. Other notable works include the Pulitzer Prize winning novel Aerosmith. A few years later Sinclair would become the first American author to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you can see his work on screen as well, like the Oscar winning 1960 film Elmer Gantry. Lewis died while in Rome from advanced alcoholism at the age of 65. One of the biggest names to come out of Minnesota, for a time, didn't go by a name at all, just this symbol. We're at Paisley Park just outside Minneapolis, the creative home of Prince Rogers Nelson. Prince. The talented singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist pioneered the Minneapolis sound, incorporating a number of styles from funk and R&B to rock, pop, and jazz. He's considered one of the most talented and versatile musicians of his generation. He rose to prominence in the 80s with hits like When Doves Cry, this is what it sounds like when the doves cry. and 1999. His sixth album, Purple Rain, would also serve as the soundtrack to his 1984 film of the same name. He won an Oscar for Purple Rain. Prince would go on to become one of the best-selling artists of all time. In 2016, doctors were called in to help Prince overcome opioid addiction. Tragically though, help would not come soon enough. Prince died from an accidental overdose of fentanyl at just 57. He was cremated, his ashes placed in a custom 3D printed urn, made to resemble Paisley Park. The urn was on display for a time here at Paisley Park, but has since been removed from public display and placed in the vault. Paisley Park itself now stands as a monument to Prince's legacy. This is Dassel Community Cemetery. This unique monument belongs to Magnus Johnson. You could probably guess from the mini Capitol dome that Johnson was a politician who served in both the House and the Senate. He's the only Swedish-born person to serve in the U.S. Senate. Here too is his son, Francis. His curious claim to fame is as the creator of the world's largest ball of twine rolled by a single individual. For reasons unknown, Francis wrapped twine for hours a day from 1950 to 1979 until it measured some 12 feet in diameter and weighed around 17,000 pounds. Weird Al even referenced it in his song, The Biggest Ball of Twine in Minnesota. We're gonna see the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. This Calvary Cemetery is located in Rochester, Minnesota. Here lies Moonlight Graham. In 1905, he played just a single game in the major leagues with the New York Giants as a right fielder. He never even got a chance at bat. He then played in the minor leagues before becoming a doctor. Graham would be one of the characters in the book Shoeless Joe, which was later made into the film Field of Dreams. Dr. Archibald Moonlight Graham was portrayed by Burt Lancaster in his final film role, and by Frank Whaley as young Archie. The real Doc Graham lived to be 88. Time to say goodbye to Minnesota, and hello to their neighbors to the south in Iowa. Resurrection Cemetery in Dubuque is our first Iowa stop. In these grounds rests Don Amici. The beloved actor and comedian began his career on vaudeville, before becoming a major star on radio in the 30s. Hollywood would come calling, making him a romantic lead in films like Hollywood Cavalcade and Down Argentine Way. He enjoyed something of a second career in the 80s, as the villain in Trading Places, and as Art in Cocoon, a role which earned him an Oscar. Don died from cancer at age 85. After his death he was cremated, his ashes reportedly buried somewhere here in the family plot of his wife, Honore Prendergast though the exact location remains something of a mystery, and there is no marker for him. Moving into the Des Moines area, we reach Highland Memory Gardens. Here is a musician named Paul Gray. He was the bassist, background vocalist, and songwriter for the heavy metal band Slipknot. He was known as the Pig, or Number Two. He was a founding member of Slipknot, which formed in 1995 and rose to prominence after the release of their debut album in 1999. Their hits include Wait and Bleed and Psychosocial. On May 
24, 2010, Gray was found dead in his Iowa hotel room from an overdose of morphine and fentanyl. He was 38. Let's wrap up our time here at Highland enjoying a little music from the bell tower. This is Riverside Cemetery, the burial site of Grant Wood. Wood was one of America's great painters, known for his work depicting the American Midwest. He's particularly well known for his 1930 painting, American Gothic. It remains one of the most familiar images of 20th century art. Grant Wood was just 50 when he died from pancreatic cancer. He's buried here alongside his sister, Nan, who was the model for the farmer's daughter in American Gothic. At Oak Hill Cemetery in Cedar Rapids, we find the other model for American Gothic. This is Byron H. McKeeby. He was the dentist and family friend of Grant Wood, and was the model for the farmer in American Gothic. A quiet, unassuming country dentist with one of the most famous faces in the world. Our last Iowa stop is Mount Calvary Cemetery in Cedar Rapids. Here lies Fran Allison. She was immensely popular with children for decades as the human performer in a show of puppets, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, which ran from 1947 to 1957, something of a predecessor of shows like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers. The show was mostly ad-libbed, Fran interacting with puppet characters in whimsical ways. Fran would earn an Emmy nomination for Most Outstanding Personality. She lived to be 81. We've reached Missouri. At Mount Olivet Cemetery in Kearney, we find a man indelibly embedded in American folklore. Here lies Jesse James. He was an American frontier outlaw, active in the 1860s and 70s. During this time, he formed the James Younger Gang, known for robbing trains, banks, and stagecoaches across the Midwest. After a disastrous attempt to rob a bank in Minnesota that left many of the gang dead, Jesse James returned to Missouri to live quietly under an assumed name. But there was a bounty on his head, one cashed in by a new recruit to the gang. Bob Ford shot him in the back of the head. Dead at 34, Jesse James went from minor celebrity to Wild West legend. He was originally buried on the property of his home before being exhumed and moved here to Mount Olivet. James was portrayed by Brad Pitt in the movie The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Connecting history through the world's graveyards, we travel to Richmond Cemetery and find the man who shot Jesse James, Bob Ford. He was an eager new recruit, joining the gang around the time when Jesse was considering giving up the life of crime. But the $10,000 bounty, along with the promise of a full pardon for past crimes, was too much for Bob to resist. On April 3, 1882, he shot Jesse James in his own home while his back was turned, while famously dusting a picture on the wall. Bob Ford and his brother claimed the reward and turned themselves in, but were dismayed when charges were brought against them. They were sentenced to death by hanging for murder, but were pardoned by the governor. Ten years later, a man named Edward O'Kelly entered a saloon that Bob Ford owned, pulled out a shotgun, and killed him. Bob was 30. Next up is Forest Hill Cemetery in Kansas City. Here lies Buck O'Neill. He played baseball in the Negro American League between 1937 and 1955, mainly for the Kansas City Monarchs as a first baseman. After retiring from playing, he would become a scout for the Chicago Cubs, and then in 1962, the first black man to coach a Major League Baseball team, also the Cubs. Buck was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2022. He lived to be 94. Another baseball legend is here at Forest Hill, Satchel Paige. He was a pitcher in the Negro Leagues beginning in the 20s. He'd become one of the greatest players in the Negro Leagues. In 1948, at age 42, he made his debut for the Cleveland Indians, making him not only the first black pitcher in the American League, but the oldest player to ever debut in the major leagues. He played his last major league game in 1966 at the age of 59, also a record that stands. 
Page died after a heart attack at age 75. Let's move on to Missouri's music legacy. Lincoln Cemetery is in Independence. Here lies the legendary Charlie Bird Parker. He was a jazz saxophonist, band leader, and composer. Parker was virtuosic as a soloist, and a pioneer of the bebop style, one of the most influential figures in modern jazz. His innovations expanded the harmonic language of jazz, a style perhaps best exemplified in his track, Coco. <laughs> Drug addiction and mental health problems took their toll on Bird's health and career. He died March 12, 1955 at the Stanhope Hotel in New York from lower pneumonia and a bleeding ulcer, and had also suffered a heart attack. He was 34. Charlie Bird Parker was portrayed by Forrest Whitaker in the 1988 film Bird. This mausoleum is found at Mount Moriah Cemetery. Here we find the niche of Ralph Barton. Before there was Al Hirschfeld, there was Ralph Barton, the first Hollywood caricaturist. He became well known for his cartoons and caricatures of celebrities and movie stars in the 1920s. Among his most famous is this 1922 caricature from Vanity Fair, featuring many of the giants of Hollywood's nascent years. How many can you identify from our previous videos? Let's see, there's Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, Will Rogers, B.B. Daniels, Bill Hart, Wallace Reed, Gloria Swanson, Nazimova, Charlie Chaplin, Jackie Coogan, Fatty Arbuckle, Rex Ingram, Malice Terry, and Sesame to Bill. <gasps> Whew, among others. Barton's work was much in demand and became synonymous with the jazz age. But at the onset of the Great Depression, his career waned, and so did his self-esteem and sanity. Barton shot himself in the head at age 39. Let's take a ride now to Peach Valley Cemetery in Anderson. Here lies actor Dabs Greer. He's perhaps best remembered for his role as Reverend Alden in Little House on the Prairie and Jonas on Gunsmoke. And his film roles include as Old Paul in The Green Mile and Wilbur in Little Giants. Every character actor in their own little sphere is the lead. This is Lee's Summit Historical Cemetery. Earlier we visited Jesse James. Well, here is the younger of the James Younger Gang, Cole Younger. Cole was the eldest of the Younger Brothers who joined the James Gang, bouncing state to state robbing trains and banks. After the robbery in Minnesota that went awry, the Youngers and the Jameses separated. Cole and his brothers Jim and Bob were eventually caught and imprisoned, then paroled in 1901. Cole lived out the rest of his life in relative normalcy, passing away at 72, while Jim, buried nearby, committed suicide a year after being paroled. This is Belle Reve Memorial Gardens in the St. Louis area. Here is the grave of Stan Musial. He was a professional baseball player for 22 seasons, playing outfield and first base for the St. Louis Cardinals between 1941 and 1963. He's regarded as one of the greatest left-hand hitters in the history of the game. He would win three World Series with the Cardinals, as well as being a 24-time All-Star and three-time MVP. After playing, Musial would serve as general manager for the Cardinals, and was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1969. He lived to be 92. There's an Independent Order of Odd Fellows Cemetery here in Missouri, in Lancaster. This is where William Preston Hall is laid to rest. He was a 19th and early 20th century animal broker and circus impresario. He would be known as the Colonel, Diamond Billy, and the Horse King of the World. This latter moniker came as he was heavily involved in the horse and mule trade. It was on an overseas business trip in this regard that he developed an interest in circuses and expanded his trade to include more exotic animals like elephants and camels, which he would broker for circuses. He even traveled briefly with his own show, The Great W.P. Hall Show. He died from cancer at age 68. Hazelwood Cemetery in Springfield is our last Missouri stop. Here lies Payne Stewart, a professional golfer who won 11 PGA Tour events including three major championships. He won his first major title in 1989 and would be a popular fixture with golf enthusiasts. But his tragic and untimely death at the age of 42 would be one of the most unusual accidents in aviation history. On October 25, 1999, he was aboard a Learjet from Orlando bound for Dallas. Shortly after takeoff, the plane went silent, controllers unable to get a response from the crew. 
A fighter pilot in the area was sent to intercept the plane. He made visual contact of the plane flying normally, but still unable to make contact. Hours later, a second fighter plane was directed to intercept. He too spotted the plane flying normally, unable to see into the cockpit because the windows were frosted over. And there was still no reaction at all from the plane, flying eerily quiet, almost like a ghost through the air. It never turned toward its intended destination of Dallas, but continued northwest in a straight line. Nearly four hours after takeoff, the plane suddenly and rapidly began to descend, spinning out of control and crashing in South Dakota. Investigators determined that what had happened was shortly after takeoff, cabin pressure was lost and all aboard were incapacitated by the lack of oxygen. With autopilot engaged, the airplane continued to fly on its own until it simply ran out of gas. After his death, Payne Stewart was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. Where should we head to next, Hugh Jackman? Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plain. Oklahoma. Let's begin by visiting Oklahoma's favorite son. We're at the Will Rogers Museum here in Claremore to find the grave of its namesake, Will Rogers. The skills Will Rogers developed as a youth in rural Oklahoma, such as riding and roping, would be brought to the vaudeville stage in the early 1900s in Wild West shows. By 1917, he joined the Ziegfeld Follies, where he not only exhibited his skills as a cowboy, but also began making humorous observations about life. He would soon become as well known as a humorist as he was a performer, his earthy anecdotes and folksy style allowing him to address otherwise controversial issues. By the 20s and 30s, he was one of the most famous and popular entertainers in America. He would star in a number of films in this era, Silence like The Rope and Fool, and Talkies like Life Begins at 40. Before his death, Rogers once said, When I die, my epitaph, or whatever you call those signs on gravestones, is going to read, I joked about every prominent man of my time, but I never met a man I didn't like. I'm so proud of that. I can hardly wait to die so it can be carved. He didn't have to wait long. In August 1935, he was flying with famed aviator Wiley Post in Alaska. On takeoff, the engine failed at low altitude and the aircraft plunged into the lagoon, killing both Rogers and Post. Will Rogers was 55. He was temporarily entombed at Forest Lawn Glendale before finally being laid to rest here. In our previous visit to Oklahoma in our first viewers series, we visited the grave of Roy Clark at Memorial Park Cemetery here in Tulsa. At the time, his grave was unmarked. Since that time, this beautiful marker has been placed. Roy was a musician and actor known and loved by generations of country fans as the co-host of the sketch comedy show Hee Haw, beginning in 1969 for over 300 episodes. Welcome to Hee Haw, starring Buck Owens and Roy Clark. He'd make guest appearances on shows like the Beverly Hillbillies, and in 1987 joined the Grand Ole Opry. Roy was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame in 2009, and lived to be 85. Another legendary country musician rests here, Bob Wills. He's considered by many as one of the founders of Western Swing music, the king of Western Swing. He rose to prominence in the 30s, putting out a number of chart-topping hits in the years to follow, like Sugar Moon. Wedding bells will be chiming neat the old sugar moon. Bob Wills died from pneumonia at age 70. This is Hillcrest Memory Gardens in Spencer. Here lies Charles Hall. He was a United States Army Air Corps aviator during World War II. A member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, in January 1943 he was one of the first flak pilots assigned to combat duty with the 99th Pursuit Squadron in North Africa. During a mission in the Mediterranean Theater in July 1943, Lieutenant Hall earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for shooting down a German fighter. In doing so, he became the first African-American pilot to earn official credit for shooting down an enemy plane in the Second World War. Hall was just 51 when he died. Welcome to Pahaska, gateway to the tall grass prairie. Pahaska City Cemetery is where Ben Johnson is laid to rest. He was a world champion rodeo cowboy, stuntman, and actor. His rodeo experience brought authenticity to his screen roles in westerns. His role as Sam the Lion in 1971's The Last Picture Show would earn him an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, and a Golden Globe and BAFTA as well. 
1982, Ben was inducted into the Western Performers Hall of Fame. He died from a heart attack at age 77. We're at Rose Hill Burial Park now. In the wall of crypts, we find Glenn A. Larson. He was a television producer known for creating numerous popular shows like Battlestar Galactica, Magnum P.I., Knight Rider, and more. He would also compose the theme music for many of the shows he created. Glenn died from cancer at age 77. Next up is Green Hill Cemetery. This lovely view brings us to the grave of actor James Noble. He's perhaps best remembered for his role as Governor Gatling on the 70s and 80s series Benson. And his film roles include as Reverend Witherspoon in 1776 and Father O'Flanagan in Airplane 2. James lived to be 94. Our journey through America's heartland brings us now to Doherty Cemetery and the grave of Kay Starr. She was a pop and jazz singer who enjoyed considerable popularity in the 40s and 50s. Kay would have a number of chart-topping gold singles like Wheel of Fortune in 1952. While the wheel is turning, turning, I'll be yearning, yearning. She would play herself in a couple films, including When You're Smiling in 1950. Kay died from complications of Alzheimer's at age 94. We've arrived at Sunset Memorial Park in Norman. Here lies Michael Dunn, actor, singer, prodigy, and bona fide genius. Despite standing just 3 feet 10 inches tall, Dunn made a big impact on screen. He played Dr. Loveless in The Wild Wild West and had a memorable turn on Star Trek. On film, Michael was nominated for an Oscar for his role in 1965's Ship of Fools making him the first actor with dwarfism to be nominated for an Academy Award. This is a ship of fools. I'm a fool, and you'll meet more fools as we go along. This tub is packed with them. Michael was also nominated for a Tony Award for his role in the play Ballad of the Sad Café. He was just 38 when he died in his sleep. Park Grove Cemetery is our next Oklahoma stop. Here we find the grave of Ralph Blaine, he was a composer noted for co-composing music and songs for the movie Meet Me in St. Louis. These songs include The Trolley Song, Clang, clang, clang went the trolley, and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Blaine was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1983 and lived to be 81. Moving right along to Sunny Lane Cemetery. This is the niche of singer Ricky Smith. You fans of American Idol will remember him as a finalist in season two of the popular singing competition. He was a fan favorite and ultimately finished in eighth place. Tragically, Smith was killed in a multi-car wrong-way crash on an Oklahoma highway in 2016. He was just 36. This walk down memory lane takes us to a cemetery called Memory Lane. Here lies Tim Holt. He was a popular western star in the 40s and 50s. Perhaps destined to be so, as he was the son of western megastar Jack Holt. Tim's best known films include The Magnificent Ambersons and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Tim Holt was just 54 when he died from cancer. Years later, the Golden Boot Awards honored Holt for his lifetime contributions to western cinema. Grave Creek Cemetery is in Hichita. Here lies a beloved Native American actor named Will Sampson. He was from the Creek Nation in Oklahoma. As an actor he played Ten Bears in The Outlaw Josie Wales and Taylor in Poltergeist II, but he is perhaps best remembered for his role as Chief Bromden in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Can you hear me too? Yeah, you bet. Well, God damn, she. And they all, they all think you're, you're deaf and dumb. Will was also well known as a painter. He suffered from scleroderma, which affected his heart and lungs. In 1987, he underwent a heart and lung transplant, but died from post-operative kidney failure. He was 53. The structure here on his grave is a traditional Native American spirit house. These are built over the grave to serve as a home for the spirit of the deceased. 
Our last Oklahoma stop takes us to Highlands Cemetery in Okima. Here lies the legendary Woody Guthrie. He's considered one of America's greatest folk singers. Over his career he wrote hundreds of country, folk, and children's songs, as well as ballads. In 1940 he wrote his best known song, This Land Is Your Land, which he wrote in response to God Bless America. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. Many of his songs had a political slant, strongly opposing fascism, and inspiring future musicians like Bob Dylan. Woody Guthrie died from complications of Huntington's disease at the age of 55. His epitaph, Bound for Glory, is the title of his partially fictionalized autobiography, later made into a movie starring David Carradine as Woody. Let's cross the border north now into Kansas. Our strolls through the Great Plains bring us to cemeteries like Waldron Cemetery, where rests Tammy Faye Baker. She rose to prominence as a televangelist with her husband Jim Baker in programs like the 700 Club and the PTL Club. Tammy Faye became well known for her glamorous and eccentric personality, heavy eye makeup, and for being perhaps the only mainstream televangelist to support LGBT rights and reaching out to AIDS patients. Jim and Tammy gained additional notoriety after Jim was imprisoned for fraud and conspiracy in 1989, resulting in the dissolution of their program. Tammy Faye would go on to appear in other TV programs like Roseanne and as a panelist on Hollywood Squares. She died from cancer at age 65. Jessica Chastain just won an Oscar for her portrayal of Tammy Faye in the 2021 film The Eyes of Tammy Faye. This is Memorial Park Cemetery in Lawrence, Kansas. You fans of basketball know the name Dr. James Naismith. He was a Canadian-born physical educator and sports coach known as the man who invented basketball. In 1891, he designed the game of basketball while teaching at a YMCA training school, seeking a vigorous indoor activity for his students on a rainy day. The following year, he wrote and published the original basketball rule book. He later became an athletic director at the University of Kansas, where he founded the University of Kansas basketball program. The Basketball Hall of Fame is named in his honor in which he himself was inducted in 1959. Naismith died after a brain hemorrhage at age 78. We've arrived now in Granola and Green Lawn Cemetery, where rests Eugene Pallet. The prolific character actor of Hollywood's Golden Age parlayed his rotund physique and distinctive frog voice into memorable roles like Friar Tuck in The Adventures of Robin Hood and Alexander in My Man Godfrey. He died from throat cancer at age 65. He was cremated, his ashes interred here with his parents. Next up is Oak Hill Cemetery. Meet George Walker. He was an actor and performer in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. He's best remembered for teaming up with Burt Williams, the duo becoming one of the most popular performing teams on the vaudeville stage. In 1903, they would produce and star in the very first Broadway musical both written by and performed by black artists, titled In Dahomey, a Negro Musical Comedy. It was not only a popular success, but marked a significant shift in the representation of blacks in the theater in that era. Walker and Williams would also form the Williams and Walker Company, an agency to support African American artists. George Walker died from syphilis at just 39. Evergreen Cemetery is in Fort Scott. This is where Gordon Parks is laid to rest. He began his career as a prominent photojournalist in the 40s through the 70s, depicting the marginal existences of African Americans. He then turned to filmmaking, becoming the first African American to write, produce, and direct a film for one of Hollywood's major studios. The film was 1969's The Learning Tree. He would follow this up with the 1971 hit, Shaft. In addition to all this, he was a writer, painter, and composer. The multi-talented Gordon Parks received the National Medal of Arts in 1988, and lived to be 93. We're in Topeka now, and Topeka Cemetery. Here we find Hal Foster, he was a comic strip artist and writer known for creating and producing the comic strip Prince Valiant, 
a fantasy adventure set in medieval times. It debuted in 1937 and continues to this day under other artists. Foster was known for the incredible detail and precision of his artwork. He lived to be 89. Our travels take us now to Caldwell Cemetery, where rests Max Showalter. One of his more notable film roles is alongside Marilyn Monroe and Gene Peters in Niagara. And on the Broadway stage, he played Horace in over 3,000 performances of Hello, Dolly. Max was also a familiar face on television, making guest appearances on just about every major show of that era, like Perry Mason, Hazel, and of course my favorite, The Twilight Zone. He died from cancer at age 83. This Highland Cemetery is in Wichita. Here we find Sidney Toller. As an actor, he's best remembered for his recurring role as Chinese-American detective Charlie Chan in 22 films between 1938 and 1946. The character of Charlie Chan originated in books and was conceived in an effort to portray Asians in a more positive light, as an intelligent protagonist and hero rather than the stereotypical villain. And while it may have been a step in that direction, the legacy of the Charlie Chan character on screen is still a mixed one, as he was often portrayed on screen by white actors like Sidney Toller. He died from cancer at age 72. Moving into Independence, we reach Mount Hope Cemetery. In these grounds is a noted playwright by the name of William Inge. In the 50s, he had a string of Broadway hits, including Come Back, Little Sheba, and Picnic, which earned him the Pulitzer Prize. With his depictions of small-town life, he became known as the playwright of the Midwest. He would take his skills to the big screen as well, winning an Oscar for writing 1961's Splendor in the Grass. Several of his plays would be adapted as films as well, like Marilyn Monroe's Bus Stop, as well as Picnic. Inge died of suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning at the age of 60. Our last Kansas stop is Elmwood Cemetery in Coffeyville. Here we find another one for you Old West outlaw enthusiasts. This is the grave of the notorious Dalton Gang. Brothers Bob and Grat Dalton began their lives in law enforcement before turning to a life of crime. Bob was the de facto leader of the gang who would rob banks and trains from California to Oklahoma. Bob was ambitious and wanted to outdo Jesse James by robbing two banks in one day in broad daylight. They attempted this feat on October 5, 1892. The gang split up to rob two banks across the street from one another simultaneously. As they attempted to make their escape after the robbery, Bob and Grat Dalton and Bill Power were shot and killed. The three were buried here, and for a time their grave was marked only by this pole, which was the hitching pole they had used to tie up their horses on the day of the robbery. Years later, surviving brother and fellow Dalton gang member Emmett placed this stone. Next up is Nebraska. We begin our time here in Hyannis, in a tiny cemetery in rural Nebraska, and the grave of Chuck Hayward. He was one of Hollywood's great stuntmen, known particularly for his work in westerns, doubling for most of the great western stars of the 50s to the 80s. He's particularly known for his association with John Wayne, doubling and doing stunts in some two dozen of Wayne's films. For his stunts with horses, he rode a falling horse called Twinkle Toes, which you can see here on his marker. Chuck would soon find himself acting in small roles as well, on shows like Gunsmoke and movies like The Big Country. He died from Hodgkin's disease at age 78. Moving into the capital of Nebraska, Lincoln, we reach Wayuka Cemetery. In these grounds we find Gordon McRae. He's best remembered for his starring roles in musical films of the 50s, perhaps most notably in Oklahoma and Carousel. He's also remembered for starring alongside Doris Day in On Moonlight Bay and By the Light of the Silvery Moon. He would take his singing skills to many of the variety shows of the era as well, like The Ed Sullivan Show. He died from pneumonia, complications of cancer, at age 64. The music inscribed here on his stone is the song, Oh What a Beautiful Morning, which he sang in Oklahoma. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Our next Lincoln stop is Lincoln Memorial. Let's head into the mausoleum. 
Here is the niche of actress Sandy Dennis. Her best known role is that of Honey in the 1966 film Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. The role would earn her an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Other notable roles include The Out of Towners alongside Jack Lemmon. She also had a notable career on stage, twice winning a Tony for the plays A Thousand Clowns and Any Wednesday. Sandy died from ovarian cancer at just 54. Back out to the grounds we find the grave of Brandon Tina. Born a female as Tina Brandon, he began identifying as a male in his teens, reversing his name to Brandon Tina. When two acquaintances learned Brandon's biological sex was female, this infuriated them and they forced him to disrobe to reveal the fact to attendees of a Christmas party. Later they kidnapped Brandon and gang raped him. Brandon reported this to the police, but no charges were brought against the men. Brandon being treated more as a suspect rather than victim. Incensed that the crime was reported to police, the two men again sought Brandon out, shooting and stabbing him to death. He was 21. His life and death were dramatized in the feature film Boys Don't Cry, in which Hilary Swank gave an Oscar-winning performance for her portrayal as Brandon Tina. His murder, along with that of Matthew Shepard years later, led to increased lobbying for hate crime laws in the United States. Our last state of the day is South Dakota. Mount Moriah Cemetery is in Deadwood. Here are legends of American folklore, like Wild Bill Hickok. Wild Bill garnered much notoriety in his time as a frontier soldier, union scout, lawman, gambler, and showman. He was also involved in several notable shootouts throughout his life, his skills as a marksman making him a frontier legend. He also toured briefly with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, but he was not particularly fond of performing for crowds. In 1873, Wild Bill was playing poker here in Deadwood. A man Bill had beaten in poker the day before entered the saloon and shot him point blank in the head. Wild Bill died instantly at age 39. The poker hand he was playing showed two black eights and two black aces, which has since become known as Dead Man's Hand, as alluded to in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Wild Bill has been portrayed on screen many times, including by Jeff Bridges in 1995's Wild Bill. Resting next to Wild Bill is another legend of the Old West, Calamity Jane. Wild Bill and Calamity Jane were closely associated as frontier legends and acquaintances. She too was a scout and renowned markswoman, known for being a rowdy adventurer, holding her own alongside the rugged boys, spitting tobacco and chugging beer. She even began the habit of dressing like a man after donning a uniform as a scout. But this rough and rugged adventurer also had a soft side, loved by those here in Deadwood for her role in nursing people back to health during a smallpox epidemic. Having the reputation of being able to ride and shoot better than most men, later in life she took her skills on the road in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, performing sharpshooting astride her horse, bringing the rip roaring west to life for audiences across the country. As her health waned from alcoholism, she expressed a desire to be buried next to her friend Wild Bill whose grave she occasionally visited. She was actually 51 when she died in 1903. Calamity Jane was portrayed by Doris Day in the 1953 film Calamity Jane, among numerous other media incarnations. Our final stop on our journey through America's heartland is into Smet, South Dakota. This city is famous for its association with a little house on the prairie. In DeSmet Cemetery we find the graves of the Ingalls family. Charles and Caroline Ingalls were the parents of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who documented her adolescence in the American Midwest in the late 1800s in a series of children's books, The Little House on the Prairie Books. The first book was published in 1932. As documented in these books, the Ingalls family moved quite a lot in those early years, from their original family home in Wisconsin to Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, and eventually settling down here in DeSmet. Here, Charles operated a general goods store, held various elected positions, including Justice of the Peace, and helped build the first congressional church of DeSmet. Charles, his wife Caroline, and daughters Mary, Carrie, and Grace are all buried here in DeSmet. Laura, who wrote the Little House books, is buried in Missouri. Charles Ingalls was famously portrayed by Michael Landon in the beloved Little House on the Prairie TV series and TV movies in the 70s and 80s and his wife and daughters who rest here alongside him were also portrayed as characters in the books and shows. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? 
Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.